If I had a foundation in more real business, then that would help me subsidize my interest in the not real businesses, like the film business. He is independently financing Megalopolis, which is budgeted at just under $100 million. Francis Ford Coppola, a self-financed sci-fi epic, an insane cast, and a tie-in graphic novel. Holy shit. All right, guys, so this is going to be the first in our series of vids on the great Francis Ford Coppola's upcoming sci-fi epic, Megalopolis. Production wraps spring of 2023 for Megalopolis, and the film is most likely hitting theaters in 2024. So the brief synopsis from IMDb, an architect wants to rebuild New York City as a utopia following a devastating disaster. So while this is technically a future sci-fi movie and not a gangster movie, Megalopolis will still be part of our GMTV series, Gangster Movies and Television. It's Francis Ford Coppola. He's writing it. He's directing it. It's been a passion project of his for over 40 years. He's been dreaming of making this movie since I was a kid. Was made him as a teenager? We made Apocalypse Now. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. And it's quite possibly his last film. So, what, you got a fucking problem with that? All right, let's get to the movie. As always, smash that like button, hit subscribe for more videos like this here on GMTV, gangster movies and television, mob news, mob history, all things organized crime. If it is organized, if it is crime. We're gonna talk about it. If you haven't already, be sure to watch our recent vid series and our full spoiler review of Martin Scorsese's Killers of the Flower Moon. <laughs> Speaking of great mob directors in their 80s being super ambitious and making giant epics at the end of their career. All right guys, so Megalopolis. Again, since this is our first video uh, covering Megalopolis, I thought we could do a two-parter, everything we know about Megalopolis, and then we'll do individual videos going deeper into topics after that. All right, so today for part one, we're gonna hit some interesting theatrical release info. The insane cast of this movie. The fascinating fact that Coppola is self-financing a $100 million movie. Story info, of course, including the brief synopses we do have, and then production details from interviews with Coppola himself. All right, release. Let's do it. So again, Coppola confirmed shooting of Megalopolis wrapped in spring of 23. From everything we can find, we're probably looking at a 2024. I say it that way because release info is vague for this movie. Strangely, for something this big, uh, it's kind of vague. IMDb has no set year posted, and none of the reliable online trades covering this movie have a release date. It's just kind of weird they're not being very explicit about it. So take this with a grain of salt, but this is one blog I found, worldofreal.com, quote, this movie is looking at a con 2024 release in May. Again, grain of salt, it's a blog. We're also gonna get into why I think the con thing might not be completely true when we start talking about the theatrical stuff, but again, we'll get to that. Another Megalopolis release indicates a 2024 release for the movie, and that is the Megalopolis tie-in graphic novel set for a 24 release. So on all accounts, the graphic novel is intended to be released in line with the movie, and then the book is confirmed for 24. And once again, we're going to do a two-parter of this everything we know about Megalopolis, and that's where we're going to get into the graphic novel. So as always, subscribe for that next video. But Summer of 24 does seem conceivable given the production timeline. Even with a giant scale sci-fi epic like Megalopolis, if they wrapped shooting in spring of 23, they could definitely turn the whole thing around in just over a year. All right, so theatrical release. And once again, this is what I was just mentioning before, why I'm not so sure about the con thing that they said. This is from Coppola. I'm interested in a theatrical release in theaters and IMAX theaters, and I'm excited about the possibility that for the first time in history, a movie could open up in the same day everywhere in the world. And that's what my goal is. So again, if it's for con, what I think is weird, if you're saying that it's set for a con 2024 release, and if that does come from a blog, does that mean that con, I mean, con's an event where things get screened way before, you know, general screenings. Like, I, I don't know if con is exempt for this idea that on the same day everywhere in the world maybe that you know is festival exempt i don't know but we'll see also we're going to get into the actor strike later on in the video we will not be having our jobs taken away and giving to robots but for now let's just say they got in just under the wire by wrapping spring of 23. if it had been just a few months later production would have likely been completely stopped more like Coppola just got in under the wire because he's the guy paying for it. All right, cast, man. Before we hit anything else, we have got to cover this insane cast of actors for Megalopolis. Just to name a few, starting off with the big guns, Adam Driver, Aubrey Plaza, Shia LaBeouf, like Shia LaBeouf, Forrest Whitaker, Dustin Hoffman, and John Voight. So this is from IMDb to get even deeper uh, into the cast here. Jason Schwartzman, Talia Shire, Natalie Emanuel, Giancarlo Esposito, Lawrence Fishburne. Mm -hmm. 
D.B. Sweeney, Chloe Finneman. And interestingly, you can see it doesn't say who is playing whom. So there's not a lot to go on here when it comes to predicting casting. We can make guesses based on the synopsis, but this is also a completely original story. Again, Megalopolis is written by Coppola and it's not based on a book or any kind of pre-existing source material. That said, let's talk about the cast. So just starting off, Talia Shire is Coppola's sister. That's Connie from Godfather. You're not my father! And what do you come to me for? Then we have Jason Schwartzman, which is Talia Shire's son, which is also Coppola's nephew. And he's Jason Schwartzman. Unbelievable. That whole family. Fun fact, Nicolas Cage, before he was Nicolas Cage, was Nicolas Coppola. And Nicolas Coppola is actually credited in Fast Times at Ridgemont High. It was his first and last movie as Nicolas Coppola. And then after that, Nick Cage, because he didn't want the uh, nepotism, apparently, with that last name. But yeah, I mean, this cast is just, you got the old guard, you got the new guard, you got the hottest of the hot of new actors and the hottest of the hot of, you know, the oldest of guard. I mean, at this point, how old is Dustin Hoffman? In his 80s, probably? So the new guard, you got Adam Driver and Aubrey Plaza. Uh, Aubrey Plaza is just, I mean, Adam Driver, I think we we all just know how incredible of an actor he is, but Aubrey Plaza, man, I mean, the fact that she started off in the UCB, you know, Upright Citizens Brigade Improv, then of course, Parks and Rec, she kind of grew up on that show. But most recently, I would say on commentary on this specific cast of uh, for Megalopolis, that White Lotus show, season two, when they're in Sicily, she is unbelievably good in that. I didn't see that student loan movie, whatever it's called, but I heard she was incredible in that. She has got some serious acting chops and they, they do often say, you know, if you come from comedy, it's easier to transition from comedy to drama, whereas not every dramatist can necessarily do comedy, but it's kind of easier to go the other way. But she, her presence, her eyes are just, they just lock you right in, man. She's so good. Shia LaBeouf, like, okay. I mean, this is, I guess, in between the old guard and the new guard, because he's at this point more of like a 2000s star, but we all know the background there, and I'm not going to get into the details, but interesting, you know? <laughs> this feels like an older guy casting a movie going, yeah, I don't care about the past. I'm an auteur. I'm making this. And also Shia LaBeouf, I will say, he's very open now about his mental health issues and his past. So maybe Coppola just sees that and goes, I don't believe in cancellation because I'm 80 and it's stupid to begin with. And he's right. When it comes to Shia LaBeouf, I'm not saying specifically he's right or I would cast Shia LaBeouf in a movie. I'm just saying that that's where he's coming from and I respect it. Dustin Hoffman, dude. Once again, I mean, what are you, 80? You're Dustin Hoffman. This is Benjamin. This is The Graduate, man. This is the Rain Man, Dustin Hoffman, old school, and then John Voight, Deliverance Son, Deliverance. I always think of uh, Deliverance when I think of John Voight, but of course that's Angelina Jolie's father. I mean, this is as old school as it gets when it comes to actors, very 70s, very 80s. And it's gonna be fascinating in a movie of this scale of this. Again, it's epic, right? So you have this sci-fi epic about a megalopolis. Epics typically take place over the course of decades or at least a few years. So it's good to have these super old actors, not super old, but you know what I mean? Old actors, middle-aged actors, younger actors. I think it's just that that seems right, especially for Coppola. And if this is your last movie, you might as well go balls out. Like, I want everyone in my movie. I want everyone in my movie. All right, story. So let's hit what we know about the story thus far, and then we'll get to the amazing real-life story of Coppola financing this massive film project himself. I hate to say, this might be what I find most intriguing about this entire project, is the fact that he is self-financing a $100 million movie, but we'll get to that. From Deadline, Although plot details remain vague, Megalopolis takes place in the future. So this is the official synopsis that we got. Again, the one before was from IMDb, but this is the official synopsis from Deadline. The fate of Rome haunts a modern world unable to solve its own social problems in this epic story of political ambition, genius, and conflicted love. Doesn't sound at all relevant. I don't see how a modern world unable to solve its own social problems is at all relevant. Speaking of Rome, if you're familiar with the recent nonsensical trend online where women ask their male significant other, hey babe, how often do you think about the Roman Empire? Anyway, since journalism couldn't show less integrity in 2023, Deadline thought they would pose this trending idiocy as a question to the genius, iconic filmmaker Francis Ford Coppola. So let's hear what Coppola has to say to these TikTok morons. How often do I think of ancient Rome? Quite a lot, Coppola wrote. The Roman Republic served as the example for my country, America, and its institutions, and it was the inspiration for my upcoming film, Megalopolis. All right, so this gets wordy. This is literally one sentence, and it's an entire paragraph, so... <sighs> My fascination with the Roman Republic is based on the struggle between the political parties during which the interest of the Republic yielded to the ambitions of a few powerful men who espoused the aims of political parties who established their own fortunes and authority by relying upon the armed forces to achieve those ends. 
dealing the final blow to a constitution already tottering to its fall. Okay. But yeah, I think it's fascinating to kind of go all the way into the future with this giant future city, a megalopolis, and then you're going to go all the way back to ancient Rome. So it's kind of like bookending history in a way of saying, you know, have we learned what we needed to learn <laughs> from these things? And all the things that are coming up in the sandwich that is 2023, commentary on that is really good because yes, we've gotten to a place that is very reminiscent of Rome, which is fascinating. You know, America is an empire. It is what it is. I mean, we're an empire. Is it necessarily a good thing? to be an empire. There's a lot of questions that go with that. So the fact that you may be part of some decaying empire also doesn't mean that you're part of this awful country. <laughs> You'd still have grand cities and, and the great morals and ideals of the West and all the things that make America great. So it'll be cool to see this figure in the movie who, as Coppola is saying, it's Julius Caesar meets Blade Runner, which, oh my God, bring it, bring it, bring it. Like that is almost all of the things I'm interested in in one thing. You have Italian shit. You have ancient Rome. I was a philosophy major, right? So all the philosophy of ancient Rome and Stoicism and you had Seneca, you had Marcus Aurelius, Gladiator, which is not philosophy, but it's a great movie by the great Ridley Scott. And then Blade Runner, fucking forget about it. I got on our Above and Batman Beyond YouTube channel, shameless plug. You know, Batman Beyond is based specifically on Blade Runner. Neo Los Angeles, LA 2019, as it is in the first movie. And then of course, Blade Runner 2049, also a masterpiece. So if you take, speaking of Blade Runner 2049, I mean, that might be the most relevant example of what this movie could look like for Megalopolis. If you have an auteur epic director like Denis Villeneuve in 2017, fast forward six years with the technology we have now, and you map that onto the genius of Coppola. Plus, favorite part, again, I said this in the beginning, it's two hours. We don't have to sit through two hours and 47 minutes of what is an amazing movie, a masterpiece, 2049. Roger Deakins shot the shit out of that movie. It's no one's disputing how good that movie looked, but it's two hours and 47 minutes. Like it, I consider that a two part amazing epic miniseries. That's how I watch that movie, sometimes three parts. You know, if you could make it a little less dry, I think Coppola is probably a lot better. I call Denis Villeneuve movies, including Dune, dry fi. Little to no humor, not a lot of dialogue, not a lot of joy, almost joyless. If you could make this a little less depressing, or even if it is depressing, I just think Coppola, my point is that I think Poke, Pocola? I think Coppola is better with dialogue, interpersonal stuff, drama, than Denis Villeneuve, I would say. I mean, totally different styles. I'm just saying in the setting of, let's call it Blade Runner 2049 versus the potential of Megalopolis, I think in terms of the running time and because it's a good running time and because this cast is so insane, obviously you had Ryan Gosling and Harrison Ford. Once again, I just think that dramatically this could be better. And the fact that it's cut down to two hours, like I definitely have a two hour cut of Blade Runner 2049 in my head and it runs a lot better to me. <laughs> and you know, obviously I'm just as intelligent and, and talented as Denis Villeneuve. Yeah. The two hour version of, of Blade Runner meets Julius Caesar by Francis Ford Coppola. Holy fuck. And the fact that he's financing it himself and the amount of freedom that he's going to have with it. Speaking of drama, this is what Coppola told Deadline. It's a drama about the process of replacing a ravaged metropolis with a utopian rebuild. So at its heart, it's much more hopeful than 2049. Sticking with that kind of comparison for a minute. And again, this is not to knock Blade Runner 2049. Blade Runner 2049 is not meant to leave you with a ton of hope. There's some hope, but it's kind of the point of Blade Runner overall is to say, let's not do this in the future. This seems to have hope because you're replacing it, at least this guy's vision. Whoever's playing the main character has this ambition to rebuild a utopian city. So that does have hope at its heart. So we'll see. And then Coppola goes on to say, again from Deadline, my first goal was to make a love story with heart, but then you realize it's about love and disloyalty and every aspect of human life. It echoes many other aspects of human life, like our planet being in danger, but ultimately a very optimistic film that has faith in the human ability to heal any problem that is put before us. So yeah, again, it's hopeful in the end, but it does have a lot of the stuff It echoes many other aspects of human life, not just unrealistic hope, let's call it, not just the Star Trek, there's no money, there's no conflict, well, well there's conflict, but you know what I mean, that Star Trek gets a lot of flack for being overly utopian, whereas this seems to have a character who is utopian, but as Coppola is indicating here, you know, there was this disaster, so you have the environmental commentary that you have in Blade Runner 2049, Los Angeles in 2049 is this hellscape environmentally, people are wearing all these masks, <laughs> 
again relevant. There's snow. There was a total environmental fallout between the events of the first Blade Runner movie in 2049. So it's just gotten that much more grim and there's that many more environmental lessons of we're destroying the planet. How do we rebuild and make it better? Except this is actually asking that question, whereas Blade Runner is just saying, how do we exist in this miserable world and still try to hold on to humanity? I wouldn't say as hopeful as Blade Runner 2049 is, and this is the last kind of comparison I'll make, but it's totally relevant to this, so whatever. As hopeful as Blade Runner 2049 is, I don't know how hopeful it is environmentally. Anthro hopeful and not eco hopeful. <laughs> It's hopeful about humanity, you know, not to spoil it, it's it's a six year old movie, but you know, it leaves you with that sense of Harrison Ford does have a chance to reconnect with his daughter, Ryan Gosling, although he's probably dead, at least he was able to do something heroic in the end. Like there is a lot of humanity to that. And it asks all the questions of the initial movie of questioning your own humanity, identity, all that fun Blade Runner stuff. In this way, it's this seems to be hopeful in both a, you know, it's called Megalopolis. So it's trying to build not just a more hopeful city, most likely, but a more hopeful, world because they're learning these lessons of the environmental disaster. Whereas once again, Blade Runner 2049, they're kind of just existing and suffering in it and trying to, which actually brings out the human story a little more because it's like, truly, what is the point? But we have to always try to find a point in life. We can't be nihilistic. He is independently financing Megalopolis, which is budgeted at just under $100 million. All right, so once again, man, one of my favorite parts about this entire project, this thing is self-financed. Coppola reportedly sold shares of his winery. Some people said he sold the whole winery. I don't think that's true, but for a reported, whatever it was, for a reported $120 million and then just went out and made this movie. Like nobody does that. The last person who did that, I mean, don't quote me here, but on that scale was what? Empire Strikes Back? Like everyone told George Lucas he was nuts for putting that much of his own money into a movie of that size. So one of the wisest things I did was to take my emphasis out of making a living from the movies and move it into you know, having my own company. But that's a true auteur move. Anyone doing auteur movies at this stage, yes, you have equipment and what's great about the modern day, you can be an auteur and make like a low to mid-level movie and it looks amazing with 4K cameras and production and sound, special effects now uh, that don't look like shit. <clears throat> Marvel. You know, you can make a lower scale movie look great. But at the end of the day, this is a sci-fi epic. You have to pay these actors. I'm sure a lot of them are taking pay cuts because they're like, it's my opportunity to work with The Godfather, but this guy's still showing out a shit ton of money and i also bet he doesn't want to cheap them out too you know i'm sure that he wants to make sure everybody gets paid the way that they should and does not want to deal with the studio and it's just absolutely unbelievable at the age of 80 this guy's just going fuck it i'm doing this myself we also keep getting reports that it came in under budget which of course it is you're the one who set the budget but still like he could have screwed himself out of a lot of money and every wrong movie that you make all the money that gets wasted is yours an incredibly indie and ambitious thing to do for a guy at the end of his career. I mean, this reminds me directly of Scorsese branching out into Western epics at the age of 80. Scorsese had never done a Western until Killers of the Flower Moon. <laughs> and he's 80. But in the case of Scorsese, he still didn't shell out his own money for this. Like Coppola is over here, not with a Western, but with sci-fi. And he's like, no, I'm just, I'm going to pay for the whole thing myself and make it as big as Flower Moon, which is nuts. And the best part is that he has the freedom to do what he wants on a large scale for the millionth time. You can make a smaller scale movie and still be an auteur and have a lot of control. But the trade-off is that you don't get a lot of money to do it. You're not doing large scale is the point, smaller scale. This guy can do whatever he wants on a large scale scale because other people aren't paying for it. He has no one to answer to. Whereas I think even Scorsese, even though he's Scorsese level, I'm sure he didn't answer to too many people, but that was still Paramount put it out. Apple put in a lot of money for that. Before that, he was working with Netflix. And then Coppola comes along. He's like, you know what? I'm just going to sell my fucking winery and make a sci-fi epic. And I'm Coppola. Like you would expect he would do something. I don't know. Like he's done other stuff beside mob movies, of course, and, and a lot of other stuff beside mob movies. It's just sci-fi from Coppola is pretty awesome. All right, guys. So that's what we're going to stop for today. Part two, we're going to do the same format, everything we know so far about Megalopolis. We're going to hit some more interviews with Coppola and then also the cast. So we have quotes from Adam Driver, some other people, some interesting production stuff. We're going to talk deeper about the tie-in graphic novel, which is a comic nerd. I can't wait to talk about. We're not going to get too deep into it. This is, of course, a film channel overall, but we do definitely have to talk about the graphic novel because that's part of the whole movie. It's part of the release. An image breakdown, all the images that we have so far from Megalopolis 
Papadopoulos, some of which you saw in this video, but we're going to break them down even more. All right, guys. So once again, subscribe as always and check out our recent review, our full spoiler review of Martin Scorsese's Killers of the Flower Moon, as well as a bunch of other Killers of the Flower Moon videos before that. All right, guys. Ciao.